Hey guys, it's Layla from Ignite, and I'm here today to talk about a topic called intertextuality. Now, if you're a student who's doing any comparative study, or if just conceptually you've come across this idea and you're not really sure about what it entails, this content will be really useful for you. I will just flag though that there are some more intricate and advanced concepts that I'm going to deal with and I will refer quite a bit to literary critics. So just hang in there with me, I'll do my best to break it all down quite slowly but just to warn you guys it is more of an intellectually engaging topic that I want to bring to you guys today. So in order to fully flesh out and explain what intertextuality entails, I'm going to take you through some of the key theorists who have developed and refined this idea, and towards the end of tracing that trajectory, I'll summarise it and show you how it applies very explicitly to textual studies. But to start off, I just want to contextualise where this concept originated from. To give you a little bit of background, when we read text today and we unpack the meaning in text, the way that we do so through unpacking language form and feature and really understanding how you have personally read a text, is because we're reading text in what's called the post-structural context. Now don't be too concerned with the label, but purely going through the context just kind of breaks down why we're even considering this notion of intertextuality. So this idea of post-structuralism came about during the 1960s. And bear with me if you think I'm going a little bit off topic, it will make sense to the overarching picture, I promise. So prior to this 1960s period, when literary critics or anyone was reading a text in more of an institutionalized form, so in schools or in unis, they had this idea that in every text there was kind of like one singular meaning in that text. There was one way of really unlocking what that text was about. And they typically looked at that through categorising different meanings that were conveyed in the text and really caring quite a bit about the author's intention in looking at a text. So even delving into the biographical details of the author, you know, where they were when they were writing certain parts of the landscapes in text, and that's how they deciphered the meaning of that type of text. When we move into the post-structural period, which I said starts around the 1960s, and I'm flagging that year because the key thinkers are coming around in this time, movement into that post-structural period said, hang on, let's react against this structural reading and let's start to think about text on their own merit. And that is to kind of divorce the text from the composer. And when I say divorce from the composer, I mean we're not really caring what the author intended in writing the text. We're kind of accepting this idea that there is a multiplicity or a plethora of meanings that are contained in a text and your personal background and how you read the text will obviously direct or elucidate that meaning in different ways. So if that sounds aligned with how you understand textual analysis, you think about the text on its own merit, you start to break down the language forms and features and you bring in your own background to reading the text, that framework came about in the post-structural era. And the way it came about was how literary critics were starting to point out the flaws in that structural way of reading text as there being one singular meaning which underlies. All right, so what I want you to consider is post-structuralism, okay, this is why we read text in the way we do, and the fundamental feature which leads into intertextuality, where this concept of intertextuality came into being, is starting to consider that texts don't have a singular meaning, and this meaning isn't necessarily construed specifically and only through the thoughts of the composer. So that's our starting point. Okay, now one of the key thinkers who started this notion of intertextuality within the post-structural concept was Julia Kristeva. And she was doing this, and this is not necessarily explicit to your own studies, but she was doing a commentary on this guy called Bakhtin, and he had quite a few texts on the concept of identity. And when she was critiquing his texts, in 1960 actually, she was saying that no text is self-born. And what she means by that is no text is purely original. Texts are constantly borrowing and quoting other texts, whether intentional or not. 
So this starts to pave the way for intertextuality. Remember I've said she's saying to us that no text is its own original form. A text is quoting from and borrowing from other texts, which also feeds into the fact that there's not one way of reading a text. And a text is not purely original in the meaning that it's trying to convey. In her work, Julia Kristeva develops this term called transtextuality. Don't be obsessed with the term, but the reason I am mentioning it is because it specifically speaks to intertextuality and how that concept came into being, the one we're focusing on. And what she means by transtextuality, if we take the first part of that word, trans, she's talking about how the text actually transcends itself. The meaning of the text is not contained in its own bounds. It's actually informed by other texts. And when you engage with other texts, you realize new meanings in the primary text that you're studying. Okay, and this idea about relationality to other texts, other texts informing meaning, are crucial to the concepts of intertextuality. So I'm starting to pepper in key ideas that have formed intertextuality. Hang in there and we'll see it all pieced together in the next few slides. So starting point, post-structuralism, the umbrella term of the period that's forming intertextuality. Key thinker who comes along, starts this way of thinking, Chris Deva, and some of the key concepts that she has foregrounded is that no meaning in a text is singular or original. Texts transcend the bounds of themselves because the meaning extracted from them is actually informed by other texts. And finally, that there is a multiplicity of meanings because texts are relational to others. Okay, the next key thinker and probably the person who guaranteed and really crystallized this notion of intertextuality was Roland Barthes in 67, so a few years after engaging with Chris Deva. A little bit of kind of background, all of these thinkers in the period really knew each other, they had their own little literary circles and they were discussing and developing these ideas. So Roland Barthes in this very famous essay called The Death of the Author, if you're someone who's just kind of really into literary theory or you just want to understand textuality a little bit better, I definitely recommend reading his essay. It's also just quite enjoyable to read, to look at the flair and fluency of his language, and it's quite short. It's only about five or seven pages. And in The Death of the Author, as the title of the essay suggests, there's a very kind of explicit reaction to the structuralism, remembering that that previous literary period was all about the author's intention, there being a singular meaning in the text. But in Death of the Author, Roland Barthes is saying that we actually shouldn't really consider the author as the sole creator of meaning in a text. Rather, he argues that the reader, the reader's personal background, their understanding of other texts, and even their context is going to be highly influential in how you read the text. If you think about it, if you've gone and watched a film right with your friends and you walk out of the film and you're both discussing what you took away, some of you may have cried at different moments if it was you know, a bit of a tragic film or you would have laughed at different parts in different ways. And that's because your own personality, your own personal experiences are gonna impact how you read that text. And that elucidates the very basis of intertextuality, right? This idea I'm starting to formulate that there's not one way of construing meaning in a text. It's going to be influenced by other people and their personal views. And that's why Barthes says that when we look at a text in this post-structural lens, right, telling us that there's not one meaning, there is a multiplicity of meanings in the text. And that's one key point that he raises. The second key point, which I want you to focus on a little bit more, is this idea that Barthes brings forward, which is that texts are not purely original in the words that they use or the meaning they create. And that is because, he says, there has been this entire trajectory of literary history. And whether the author knows it or not, the author is actually going to be referencing and quoting from and borrowing from the quotes and the nature of other texts. There are always going to be connections to other texts because of this circularity of language that exists within literature. So what Barthes actually says in the essay, and one of the famous quotes from it, is that a text is a tissue of citations drawn from the innumerable references of culture. And how this crystallizes Kristeva's idea is that he's saying every text is essentially, 
quoting from other texts. This is why it's not purely original. He's actually extending on Kristeva's quote that the text is not self-born because it is that tissue of quotations. And on a very meta level, this dialogue that Barthes is actually having with Kristeva on intertextuality through referencing her essay is intertextuality in and of itself. He is referencing another composer within his own essay to expand on the notion he is trying to convey. So we've moved. Post-structuralism, Kristeva, plurality of meaning, no originality, crystallized by Barthes, which says that the reader is really important in conveying the meaning or actually extracting the meaning from the text. And furthermore, that the text is not purely original. There is not one singular theological meaning in that text. There's a multiplicity of meanings. The next person who comes along and actually categorizes what Barthes conveys in his text is a guy called Gerard Jeanette. And his title of this very famous text that conveys into textuality is Palimpsests. And the title actually suggests a text which is an accumulation or a binding of other texts, which is essentially what intertextuality is, right? It's when the text is binding and quoting from other texts. And he says that intertextuality, okay, at this stage you should be understanding intertextuality as encompassing this notion that there are multiple meanings in texts, that texts are quoting from and borrowing from other texts, and finally that the reader is the essential creator of meaning in the text rather than the author. Okay, and this intertextuality can occur in relation to Gerard Jeanette in three ways. The first one being implicit or explicit connections between texts. So for example, if you're a student and you're starting a comparative module and one of the texts you're looking at is the adaptation of another text, that's an explicit example of intertextuality. In one text, inter one of the texts are references to another text. Okay. And the effect of that is through seeing an aspect of another text reframed in that adaptation, it's starting to extend your understanding and the meaning that you've taken away from that original text. So we see how the development of meanings that you extract from a text are relational to another external text. The second category that he comes up with are the covert or overt examples. So whether we obviously see the intertextual reference or whether it's more underlying within the text construction. And finally, hidden or open, which is quite similar to the third category. But what I want you to focus on the most, especially if you're a student doing a comparative study module, is that implied and explicit example. And the reason this is really important is because when you're looking at texts which are adaptations of other texts, there is an implied connection that also exists. Because that adaptation text, right, the latter text in time, which is referencing an earlier text, actually relies on your understanding of the original text in order to fully unlock what's going on in that later text, okay? And that's the implied intertextual connection. And when you engage with this notion of intertextuality, you come to understand that what you've taken away from that original text that you've read now that you've gone and read the adaptation, your understanding of the first text is actually extended and transformed in an implied way by engaging with an other text that has adapted it. Okay, so this is the effect of intertextuality, the concept that we've come to understand through thinking about these key critics. A later thinker is a guy called Robert Stamm, and the reason I've actually brought him up just very briefly is because he has a good essay called The Dialogics of Adaptation, which I recommend you read. And the title itself is actually quite relevant to students that are studying textual conversations, right? Because if you think about it, Dialogics of Adaptation, he talks about the fact that texts which adapt earlier texts open a dialogue with them. So if you're thinking about texts in a comparative framework, Wherever you are, whatever you're studying, it's interesting to think about this idea that when texts are actually explicitly commenting on another one, they're opening this dialogue between them. So the takeaway point that I'd like you guys to consider, and hopefully what I've conveyed through this intertextuality notion, is that all texts are proximal to others. All texts are relating to them, whether they intend to or not, because texts have been around for so long. 
Furthermore, meaning in text is fluid rather than fixed, okay? And remember that example I gave you earlier on about the adaptation. If you're studying two texts, right, you've read one original text and then you've gone and you've looked at an adaptation. The understanding that you extracted from that first text through looking at a reframing or a reimagining of it through another text will deepen, it will change what you thought of that original text. And that's the prime example of intertextuality, meaning it's being reconfigured and transformed when you engage with the other text, the text which transcends the bounds of the original one that you were looking at. And finally, this idea that the meaning within the text then is being shaped, it's constantly changing and it's constantly transforming because of this inevitable nature of intertextuality. I'm going to leave it there. I hope that was really useful and I hope that all of the intricacies of the explanation pieced together and they clarified your understanding of what intertextuality is. And hopefully if you are doing a comparative study, it's given you the framework of how those connections between texts have contributed to your extraction of meaning within them. I know this is a hard topic to engage with, so please, you are more than welcome to comment. I would love if you did, and I'll engage with your comments to try and clarify any questions you have further. If you do like the content, please make sure you subscribe, and we'll have more of this coming your way. But for now, thank you so much for bearing with me and watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching once again. If you are enjoying our content and we hope you are, please do like and subscribe to our channel. And of course, share with your friends. That's right guys, thanks for watching. But please do make sure you check out our very special resources. They're quite unique. We've made a whole bunch of state rank practical guides for all you English texts out there. So check out the link now at ignitehsc.com.au. Let us know what you think. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next video.